Saint Augustine on the Most Holy Trinity, Book 9, Chapter 3 The image of the Trinity in the mind of man who knows himself and loves himself, the mind knows itself through itself. For the mind can't love itself except also it know itself. For how can it love what it does not know? Or if anybody says that the mind from either general or special knowledge believes itself of such a character as it has by experience found others to be and therefore loves itself, he speaks most foolishly. For whence does a mind know another mind if it does not know itself? For the mind does not know other minds and not know itself as the eye of the body sees other eyes and does not see itself. For we see bodies through the eyes of the body, because unless we are looking into a mirror, we can't refract and reflect the rays into themselves, which shine forth through those eyes and touch whatever we discern, a subject indeed, which is treated of more subtlety and obscurely, until it be clearly demonstrated whether the fact be so or whether it be not. But whatever is the nature of the power by which we discern through the eyes, certainly whether it be rays or anything else, we can discern with the eyes that power itself, but we inquire into it with the mind, and if possible understand even this with the mind. As the mind then itself gathers the knowledge of corporeal things through the senses of the body, so of incorporeal things through itself. Therefore, it knows itself also through itself, since it is incorporeal. For if it does not know itself, it does not love itself. Chapter 4, Summary The three are one and also equal, vice, the mind itself and the love and the knowledge of it. That the same three exist substantially and are predicated relatively. That the same three are inseparable. That the same three are not joined and commingled like parts, but that they are of one essence and are relatives. But as they are two things, the mind and the love of it, when it loves itself, so there are two things, the mind and the knowledge of it, when it knows itself. Therefore, the mind itself and the love of it and the knowledge of it are three things, and these three are one. And when they are perfect, they are equal. For if one loves himself less than as he is, as for example, suppose that the mind of a man only loves itself as much as the body of a man ought to be loved, whereas the mind is more than the body, then it is in fault and its love is not perfect. Again, if it loves itself more than as it is, as if, for instance, it loves itself as much as God is to be loved, whereas the mind is incomparably less than God, here also it is exceedingly in fault, and its love of self is not perfect. But it is in fault more perversely and wrongly still, and it loves the body as much as God is to be loved. Also, if knowledge is less than that thing which is known, and which can be fully known, then knowledge is not perfect. But if it is greater, then the nature which knows is above that which is known, as the knowledge of the body is greater than the body itself, which is known by that knowledge. For knowledge is a kind of life in the reason of the knower, but the body is not life. 
and any life is greater than any body, but in bulk, but in not in bulk, but in power. But when the mind knows itself, its own knowledge does not rise above itself, because itself knows and itself is known. When, therefore, it knows itself entirely and no other thing with itself, then its knowledge is equal to itself, because its knowledge is not from another nature, since it knows itself. And when it perceives itself entirely and nothing more, then it is neither less nor greater. We said therefore rightly that these three things, mind, love and knowledge, when they are perfect, are by consequence equal. Similar reasoning suggests to us, if indeed we can anyway understand the matter, that these things i.e. love and knowledge, exist in the soul. <clears throat> and that being as it were involved in it, they are so evolved from it as to be perceived and reckoned up substantially, or so to say essentially, not as thou in a subject as color or shape or any other quality or quantity are in the body. For anything of this material kind does not go beyond the subject in which it is. For the color or shape of this particular body can be also those of another body. But the mind can also love something besides itself with that love with which it loves itself. And further, the mind does not know itself only but also many other things. Wherefore, love and knowledge are not contained in the mind as in a subject, but these also exist substantially, as the mind itself does, because even if they are mutually predicated relatively, yet they exist each severely in their own substance. Nor are they so mutually predicated relatively as color and the colored subject are, so that color is in the colored subject, but has not any proper substance in itself, since colored body is a substance, but color is in a substance. But as two friends are also two men, which are substances, why they are said to be men, not relatively, but friends relatively. But further, although one who loves or one who knows is a substance and knowledge is a substance and love is a substance, but he that loves and love and he that knows and knowledge are spoken of relatively to each other as our friends, yet mind or spirit are not relatives as neither are men relatives Nevertheless, he that loves and love, or he that knows and knowledge can't exist separately from each other, as men can that are friends. Although it would seem that friends too can be separated in body, not in mind, in, so far, in as far as they are friends, nay, it can even happen that a friend may even also begin to hate a friend, and on this account cease to be a friend, while the other does not know it, and still loves him. But if the love with which the mind loves itself ceases to be, then the mind also will at the same time cease to love. Likewise, if the knowledge by which the mind knows itself ceases to be, then the mind will also at the same time cease to know itself. Just as the head of anything that has a head is certainly a head, and they are predicated relatively to each other, although they are also substances, for both a head is a body, and so is that which has a head. And if there be no head, then neither will there be that which has a head. Only these things can be separated from each other, by cutting off 
those can't. And even if there are some bodies which can be wholly separated and divided, yet they would not be bodies unless they consisted of their own par proper parts. A part then is predicated relatively to a whole, since every part is a part of some whole, and a whole is a whole by having all its parts. But since both part and whole are bodies, these things are not only predicated relatively, but exist also substantially. Perhaps then the mind is a whole and the love with which it loves itself and the knowledge with which it knows itself are, as it were, its parts, of which two parts that whole consist. Or are there three equal parts which make up the one whole, but no part embraces the whole of which it is a part, whereas when the mind knows itself as a whole, that is, knows itself perfectly, then the knowledge of it extends through the whole of it, and when it loves itself perfectly, then it loves itself as a whole, and the love of it extends through the whole of it, Is it, then, as one drink is made from wine and water and honey, and each single part extends through the whole, and yet there are three things, for there is no part of the drink which does not contain these three things, for they are not joined as if they were water and oil, but are entirely commingled. And they are all substances, and the whole of that liquor, which is composed of the three, is one substance, is it, I say, in some such way, as this we are to think, these three to be together, mind, love, and knowledge, but what a wine and honey are not of one substance, although one substance results in the drink made from the commingling of them, and I can see how those other three are not of the same substance, since the mind itself loves itself, and itself knows itself, and these three so exist as that the mind is neither loved nor known by any other thing at all. These three, therefore, must needs be of one and the same essence, and for that reason, if they were confounded together, as it were by a commingling, they could not be in any way three, neither could they be mutually referred to each other. Just as if you were to make from one and the same gold three similar rings, although connected with each other, They are mutually referred to each other because they are similar. For everything similar is similar to something, and there is a trinity of rings and one gold. But if they are blended with each other, and each mingled with the other through the whole of their own bulk, then that trinity will fall through, and it will not exist at all. And not only will it be called one gold, as it was called in the case of those three rings, but now it will not be called three things of gold at all. Chapter 5, that these three are several in themselves, and mutually all in all. But in these three, when the mind knows itself and loves itself, There remains a trinity, mind, love, knowledge. And this trinity is not confounded together by any commingling, although they are each severely in themselves and mutually all in all, or each severely in each two, for, or each two in each. Therefore, all are in all. For certainly the mind is in itself, 
since it is called mind in respect to itself, although it is said to be knowing or known or knowable relatively to its own knowledge, and although also as loving and loved or lovable, it is referred to love by which it loves itself. And knowledge, although it is referred to the mind that knows or is known, nevertheless is also predicated both as known and knowing in respect to itself, for the knowledge by which the mind knows itself is not unknown to itself. And although love is referred to the mind that loves whose love it is, nevertheless it is also love in respect to itself, so as to exist also in itself. Since love too is loved, yet can't be loved with anything except with love, that is, with itself. So these things are severely in themselves, but so are they, e they in each other, because both the mind that loves is in love, and love is in the knowledge of him that loves, and knowledge is in the mind that knows. And each severely is in like manner in each two, because the mind which knows and loves itself is in its own love and knowledge, and the love of the mind that loves and knows itself is in the mind and in its knowledge. And the knowledge of the mind that knows and loves itself is in the mind and in its love, because it loves itself that knows and knows itself that loves. And hence also, each two is in each severely, since the mind which knows and loves itself is together with its own knowledge in love, and together with its own love in knowledge. And love to itself and knowledge are together in the mind which loves and knows itself. But in what way are all are in all, we have already shown above, since the mind loves itself as a whole, and knows itself as a whole, and knows its own love wholly, and loves its own knowledge wholly, when these three things are perfect in respect to themselves. Therefore, these three things are marvelously inseparable from each other, and yet each of them is severely a substance, and all together are one substance or essence, whilst they are mutually predicated relatively. Chapter 6. There is one knowledge of the thing in the thing itself, and another in eternal truth itself. That corporeal things, too, are to be judged the rules of eternal truth. But when the human mind knows itself and loves itself, it does not know and love anything unchangeable, and each individual man declares his own particular mind by one manner of speech, when he considers what takes place in himself, but defines the human mind abstractly by special or general knowledge. And so, when he speaks to me of his own individual mind as to whether he understands this or that, or does not understand it, or whether he wishes or does not wish this or that, I believe, but when he speaks the truth of the mind of man generally or specially, I recognize and approve. Whence it is manifest that each sees a thing in himself in such way that another person may believe what he says of it, yet may not see it, but another sees a thing in the truth itself, in such way that another person also can gaze upon it, of which the former undergoes changes at successive times, the latter consists in an unchangeable eternity. For we do not gather a generic or specific knowledge of the human mind by means of resemblance by seeing many things, many minds with the eyes of the body, but we gaze upon indestructible truth 
from which to define perfectly, as far as we can, not of what sort is the mind of any one particular man, but of what sort it ought to be upon the eternal plan. Whence also, even in the case of the images of things corporeal, we are to drawn in through the bodily sense, and in some way infused into the memory from which also those things which have not been seen are thought under a fancied image, whether otherwise than they really are, or even perchance as they are, even here too we are proved either to accept or reject within ourselves by the other rules which remain altogether unchangeable above on our mind when we approve or reject anything rightly. For both when I recall the walls of Carthage, which I have seen, and imagine to myself the walls of Alexandria, which I, sh which I have not seen, and in preferring this or that among forms which in both cases are imaginary, make that preference upon grounds of reason, the judgment of truth from above is still strong and clear, and rests firmly upon the utterly indestructible rules of its own right. And if it is covered, as it were, by cloudiness of corporeal images, yet is not wrapped up and confounded in them. But it makes a difference whether under that or in that darkness I am shut off, as it were, from the clear heaven, or whether, as usually happens on lofty mountains, enjoying the free air between both, I at once look up above through the calmest light and down below upon the densest clouds. For whence is the ardour of brotherly love kindled in me when I hear that some man has borne better torments for the excellence and steadfastness of faith? And if that man is shown to me with a finger, I am eager to join myself to him, to become acquainted with him, to bind him to myself in friendship. And accordingly, if opportunity offers, I draw near, I address him, I converse with him, I express my goodwill towards him in what words I can, and wish that in him too in turn should be brought to pass and express goodwill towards me. And I endeavor, after a spiritual embrace in the way of belief, since I can search out so quickly and discern altogether his innermost heart. I love, therefore, the faithful and courageous man with a pure and genuine love. But if he were to confess to me in the course of conversation, or were through unguardedness to show in any way that either he believes something unseemly of God and desires also something carnal in him, and that he bore these torments on behalf of such an error, or from the desire of money for which he hoped, or from empty greediness of human praise, immediately it follows that the love with which I was born towards him displeased, and as it were repelled, and taken away from an unworthy man, remains in that form after which, believing him such as I did, I had loved him, unless perhaps I have come to love him to this end, that he may become such while I have found him not to be such in fact. And in that man too nothing is changed, although it can be changed, so that he may become that which I had believed him to be already. But in my mind there certainly is something changed, vice the estimate I had formed of him, which was before of one sort and now is of another, and the same love at the bidding from above of unchangeable righteousness is turned aside from the purpose of enjoying to the purpose of taking counsel. But the form itself of unshaken and stable truth, 
wherein I should have enjoyed the fruition of the man, believing him to be good, and wherein likewise I take counsel that he may be good, sheds in an immovable eternity the same light of incorruptible and most sound reason, both upon the sight of my mind and upon that cloud of images which I discern from above, when I think of the same man whom I had seen. Again, when I call back to my mind some arch, turned beautifully and symmetrically, which, let us say, I saw at Carthage, a certain reality that had been made known to the mind through the eyes and transferred to the memory, causes the imaginary view. But I behold in my mind yet another thing according to which that work of art pleases me, and whence also, if it displeased me, I should correct it. We judge therefore of those particular things according to that form of eternal truth, and discern that form by the intuition of the rational mind. But those things themselves we either touch, if present by the bodily sense, or if absent, remember their images as fixed in our memory or picture. In the way of likeness to them, such things as we ourselves also, if we wished and were able, we'd laboriously build up, figuring in the mind after one fashion, the images of bodies, or being bodies through the body, but after, but after another, grasping by simple intelligence what is above the eye of the mind, vice the reasons and the unspeakably beauty skill of such forms. <laughs>